Today's episode is brought to you by Nobody But Me, Baby. Hello, guitar enthusiasts of every stripe and description. It's Steve, the original Guitar Nut, and welcome to Guitar Nuts Anonymous. Now, normally I put in uh, kind of a great deal of preparation before I film these episodes. At the very least, I take a shower and put on some nice clothes and pick out an interesting t-shirt. Not so today. This is pretty much how I rolled out of bed. I've been awake several hours, but this is the way you're getting me. Deal with it. Uh, also, normally I have all my topics written down on a whiteboard out of your view. Not today. I have everything saved on this phone, and I'm going to be looking at it, and that's okay. So, hopefully you enjoyed the last couple of episodes uh, when I brought out the uh, barn find Dan Electro and whatnot. Um, still haven't got around to working on that, but it's on the to-do list. And speaking of uh, not getting around to things, I've been kind of busy lately. I'm about to start a new job. Um, the music store job I'd hope would materialize has not materialized. But meanwhile, I'm switching to a different job, still chauffeuring. And that will start uh, tomorrow morning. Tomorrow being Wednesday. The, what, the 19th? Whatever. Um, anyway, so that's interesting. Um, I'm going to get to wear a new color tie, so exciting. Um, <laughs> uh, on the band front, my... Uh, 80s cover band Raygun just had what is arguably our best ever gig uh, here in Nashville, playing at a place called uh, D's Country Cocktail Lounge, which, while you know, shockingly similar in name to the place where the Blues Brothers famously played, was actually a very cool venue, uh, and it was anything but country, and uh, amazing sound, probably the best sound man we've ever had. Uh, I can't recommend him enough. I wish I remembered his name, but I'm terrible with names and numbers, dates. Unless it's about guitars, then it's like a steel trap. Go figure. Uh, am I on the spectrum? Perhaps. Um, let's see, what else? Oh, uh, someone made a recommendation recently that in the spirit of trying to uh, get some financial support for the show here, uh, that maybe I should start a Venmo make it that much easier for people to to make a contribution sort of a virtual tip jar as it were so to that end uh, I set up a Venmo it's just in my name um, I'm not one of those guys that's gonna hide my real identity uh, <laughs> I am who I am I'm Steve Rempus uh, I would say the one and only but I'm told that I have an uncle Steve who lives in California somewhere uh, I've never met him I do know he gets a lot of my uh, email because people make a mistake and add an N to my email address, and I don't use an N, and Stephen, I just use Steve. Never mind. Anyway, he gets a bunch of email, I'm sure. Um, who knows? Anyway, uh, so it, it's Venmo. It's just at Steve Rempus with the S and the R capitalized. I'll put like a, what do they call these, QR codes right over here. Um, and uh, yeah, if you care to make a contribution. Now, to that end, there's going to be a good reason to possibly make a contribution that I'm going to mention here in a few minutes. Uh, if you are interested in, you know, helping out with a <clears throat> yet another cool project. So, what's new in the uh, world of guitars? Well, the, the NAMM show in Anaheim, California is coming to a close. Um, and uh, I haven't heard a heck of a lot of big groundbreaking news per se. I mean, there's some new product launches, but nothing that really shook me or anything that I've seen. With the possible surprising exception of our beloved Rickenbacker, who it actually apparently is caving to uh, the, the, the wants of the public and reintroducing, quite possibly reintroducing, the uh, rare and spectacular and huge Model 4005 bass. Here's a photo of an original one from the 60s. Uh, absolutely huge bass. I have played one once. It was at uh, Groon's down here in Nashville. I think it was $9,000. Um, and uh, I've always wanted one. Um, unfortunately, I won't be buying one of the new ones because I'm guessing they're going to have an MSRP of something like five grand. 
Still cheaper than an original, I suppose, but uh, that's a lot of scratch. Uh, and not the kind of scratch that I am in a <laughs> position to spend. Um, but it's cool. Uh, and it, what's interesting is, is uh, the company is now run by Ben Hall, who just yesterday accepted my friend request on Facebook. So very cool. Um, Ben's dad, John, who's run the company for decades, said that they would never reintroduce the 4005 because there wouldn't be enough of a market for it. Uh, plenty of people said otherwise, and apparently Ben listened, so that's very cool. Now to that end, I mentioned that I've always wanted a 4005. I've seen on AliExpress that there are Chinese builders making copies. Um, and they look pretty pretty darn good, apart, of course, from, you know, the terrible generic R tailpiece thing, which is easily, you know, switched out. Um, and I'm thinking I'd like to have one of those. But, of course, after the whole debacle with the 360F chicken backer, I felt very, very burned. Um, that thing was terrible. And, uh, man, there's a, a chicken backer... Facebook group now. Um, there may have always been, but I just recently was invited to join. Uh, I'll, if you're interested in joining yourself, I will try to remember to put a link down here in the description. But uh, uh, there's actually quite a, quite a lot of us who are interested in chicken backers, strangely enough. Um, and it's mostly people that genuinely love Rickenbackers. I know that might seem contrary in some ways because supposedly these chicken backers are hurting Rickenbacker, although they're not. Let's be honest. If you could afford the real thing, you'd buy the real thing. And there's plenty of us out there, like me, my friend Billy. Uh, there's just a bunch of us that have the real thing and have chicken backers also. Uh, if for no other reason, then we get curious, you know. But anyway, I'm thinking I'd like to order a 4005 replica. Um, I'm going to comb through... AliExpress and try to find a builder that's offering one that actually has a good feedback. Um, most of the ones I've seen have something in like the 70s percentage of satisfied customers, which isn't really that, that great of a score. You know, 76% five-star ratings. Um, I'd like something a little better, um, you know, because obviously I want this to be an actual playable you know, instrument that I could perform with or whatever if I chose to. I don't know. But anyway, if uh, you'd interested, be interested in uh, contributing to help with the launch of the Chicken Backer Project Mark II, by all means, go to that Venmo thing, or uh, you can go to the old school way we had before, uh, go to PayPal, uh, RickenbackerAnonymous at gmail.com would be the email address for PayPal. If you want to make a contribution, it doesn't have to be big. If a, a bunch of, you know, there's nearly 400 of you out there now. If each of you contributed a dollar, we'd have the damn thing. Um, not that that'll happen, but it's just, you know, an example. Because um, most of them are selling for less than $400 ship. And of course, I'll be contributing whatever the difference is, but. Uh, uh, I'm going to be a couple of weeks without a paycheck here, so it may not be anytime soon, but it's just something for the future. Now, speaking of Operation Chicken Bagger and that terrible 360F, I just thought I'd update some people. I actually listed that thing for trade, not for sale, because you're not supposed to sell chicken baggers. Um, I listed it for trade on Facebook Marketplace locally. Got a ton of trade offers, mostly, you know, pedals and extreme low-end squire strats and stuff stuff that I absolutely have no use for but eventually some guy who is a, an amateur luthier said that he believes he can make that thing into a good playable instrument and more power to him I hope he does but he traded me this lovely 90s Dan Electro U2 reissue uh, with this really sweet aftermarket intonable replacement bridge uh, which, uh, this is a great, great guitar. I, I am thrilled. I'll use this for gigs. Uh, it sounds great. It plays great. Um, I actually had one of the original reissues back in 99 when they first came out. 
don't remember why I got rid of it, but uh, it's probably one of my, you know, move to a different household or something. But anyway, this is what became of the Chicken Backer 360F. And good riddance to the damn thing. Um, can't say I'm sorry to have seen it go. So enough about that. Um, okay, so I mentioned in the last episode that uh, I had decided that I definitely do want to have a decent eight-string guitar in my arsenal because I found myself writing lots of riffs and stuff with it and getting song ideas, and it was cool. But unfortunately, the Harley Benton I bought is not it. Um, now, I don't know. I mean, I didn't expect a lot for $150 plus shipping, but the Harley Benton isn't great. Um, action's quite high, and the only way to correct that um, results in unbelievable fret buzz everywhere. It would require a fret level and polish uh, um, crowning, which would cost as much as the base itself did. I'll probably throw that thing on uh, Facebook Marketplace as well and trade it for something. I don't know. But anyway, I decided I want an 8-string. Uh, so I was going to trade something on Marketplace. That seems to be the place to do things nowadays. And uh, so I listed a couple of guitars for trade. And one of the things that popped up was an LTD Eclipse 8. Um, they're not a company I normally, you know, think of, but uh, LTD, it's the uh, import version of ESP guitars. And they have an 8-string called the Eclipse. It looks a little like a, a sharp cutaway Les Paul. Uh, here's a picture of, of an ESP, uh, I believe it's model 258 or something. Anyway, guy contacted me and offered to trade me that guitar and a small sum of cash uh, on my end, one of my guitars and a small sum of cash for his eight string. And uh, I watched, as I always do when I'm about to get something or potentially get something new, I watched a ton of YouTube videos, uh, reviews and unboxings and things of, of that particular ESP LTD. Agreed to meet with the guy, but he had to have me drive to him which I don't normally do, but because he had automobile issues. So he claimed. So I drove 40 minutes out to him. Uh, I got five minutes from his house, and he texted me and said he was canceling our deal because somebody offered him cash and he needed the money more than he needed my guitar. Damn decent of him. Um, if I were a less peaceful man, I'd say that I should kick his ass, but uh, what are you going to do? It's it's Facebook Marketplace. So anyway, uh, meanwhile, I had been researching some other affordable eight strings. I found that there was an offering from um, Ibanez, the RG8, that sells for about 450 that gets pretty good reviews. There's a Jackson, uh, I think it's the JS32-8, that sells for like 399 they both get decent reviews, and I've watched plenty of videos on them. But a newer, uh, well, I, I guess it isn't newer, but newer to me, was a, there's a Schecter. Um, and uh, it's called the uh, C8, C8 Deluxe. And it sells for $4.99, but it's supposedly, at least from the reviews that I've read, leaps and bounds above both of the other two I mentioned. And... Uh, so I thought, well, that's nice, but I don't have $500 to throw around. And uh, so uh, I was looking at them online just because, and I found that for whatever reason, Guitar Center slash Musician's Friend, they're kind of one entity, is selling them for $3.99, which is a whole lot better deal, obviously. That's 20% off. Um, I thought, well, I don't have $400 either. Um then I got a coupon in the mail for 15% off anything at Guitar Center. So I started doing the math. 15% off of $400. Now we're looking at uh, 340 it's Starting to get more affordable, right? So I put it in my cart just to see what would happen. Because sometimes, actually the majority of the time if I'm honest, these Musician's Friend coupons don't work. Because there's a list longer than Gideon's Bible 
of items that are excluded from the, the coupon. Okay, sure enough, sector is one of the things that's excluded. But then I, a thought occurred to me that uh, it's, and the little notation popped up and said, uh, contact a musician's friend, a uh, salesperson um, for, you know, more information or whatever. And I thought, well, couldn't hurt to, you know, call and or, or message and see what they have to say. So I did. I messaged and I said, hey, uh, got this coupon. Coupon won't work. Kind of interested in one of these guitars. What can you do for me? And pretty quickly, the guy got back to me and said, no problem. Uh, I'll give it to you for that price. In fact, he gave it to me for that price, tax included. I thought, wow, that's pretty cheap. But don't have $340 either. <laughs> so you see where I'm going with this. Um, meanwhile, I managed to sell off a guitar and amp kit that I had uh, picked up on the cheaps. So I had a bit of cash handy. Um, so I knew I had some cash, right? But anyway, um, the the uh, guy at Musician's Friend was kind enough to point out the fact that I had $25 and some odd cents of credit um, from previous purchases. It's part of their rewards program. So now we're looking at like 315. It's getting better, right? And then he says, oh, and look at this. Uh, you also have an old credit of $40 um, from apparently an issue with a pedal last year. And I was like racking my brain. And I remembered when I bought my Electro Harmonics Mel 9 pedal, it showed up uh, looking used. It was supposed to be new. I mean, it worked fine, but the packaging was all chewed up and it was obviously a display piece. So I, I said something. They had given me a $40 credit that I didn't even remember that I had. So put all that together and this $500 guitar actually became affordable, right? So I ordered one and uh, it's going to be here today. And I'm going to do an unboxing episode as, you know, as soon as it shows up. Um, and I'd hope to show it to you guys in this episode, but it won't be here till tonight, apparently. So anyway, that's what's the latest thing up with the, the eight string, uh, you know, world. Uh, speaking of multi, um, well, not multi-scale, but uh, extended range instruments, something I've never owned and frankly never thought about was a seven string guitar. Um, but one of the uh, guitars that I had up for trade on marketplace for sale, seller trade, if I always make trade an option. The guy got a hold of me and said, I've got a brand new Jackson JS-22-7, seven, seven string guitar. I can't make it play in tune. Um, maybe I'm doing something wrong. I'll gladly trade you for your guitar. And the guitar that I was trying to trade uh, was like a hundred dollar item. Um, he suggested I trade him that and a little bit of money. Um, but he would also be interested in pedals. And I, so I asked him, hey, what kind of pedal are you looking for? He says, I either want a boss, like this, you know, metal zone distortion thing, or maybe a, an Ibanez tube scream or something of that nature, something I can use with my overdriven amp to get metal sounds. Well, it turned out that I had an old Ibanez metal screamer pedal from the 80s that my brother gave me years ago that I don't use. And I offered him that and the guitar, and he went for it. So I wound up with this brand new Jackson. Still has plastic uh, coating, you know, the peel off stuff on all the plastic surfaces. It's absolutely mint. Um, it's, it's practically unplayed. But sure enough, it doesn't play in tune. And uh, I can give you two real good reasons. One, the tuners were practically falling off. They were loose, never tightened from the factory, I'm guessing. And uh, he, the guy that owned it, apparently never noticed, never bothered to tighten them up. Um, even the buttons for like, to the rattle, it's as simple as tightening with a screwdriver, but he never did. The other thing, it's kind of laughable, I, I feel bad for the guy in a way, but 
if you take a look at the four higher strings on the headstock, you'll see they're wound on the wrong side of the pegs. Um, uh, so we've got some weird angles and things going on, but obviously the guy just didn't really know what he was doing, and uh, you know we're all we're all new to this at some point in time. So I uh, ordered some new strings off Amazon. They arrived last night. Later today, I'll string this up, tighten everything, uh, and I'll be able to maybe give you guys a review of, of a seven string. Looks like I'm turning into a metal head, although I'm not. My whole idea is to have the perverse joy of using these things in ways that they were never intended. Um, so that's that. Um, other news, this is all about me today, so if this is boring to you, just, you know, we're 20 minutes in, click out. But I will say, uh, I do have some uh, uh, guitars to, to show you at the end here. I'm going to show you the, the last row of uh, cases of my collection. Um, I rediscovered the joy of using real amps. Um, I've been using my modeling pedal board situation with my Strymon Iridium and whatnot going into a FRFR powered cabinet with the band. And I, I enjoy it. I mean, it, it's fine. It works great. It's got all my sounds and, you know, it works great for the band. It's portable. But I just had the hankering the other day for some reason to plug into a real genuine tube amp. So, what I did, I'll take you with me here. I busted out my pair of Fender Pro Juniors, 15 watt all tube guitars, uh, guitar amps, and put together this little pedal board here, um, with the exception of the delay pedal, they're all JRR pedals. Uh, company that I found uh, last year on uh, Reverb makes really good replicas of some high-end boutique pedals. I set this up, ran it into these two little Fender amps, played for a while, and uh, the while turned into hours. It's one of those rare days when I had some time off from work. I realized what I've been missing. Um, sometimes it's really good to step out and you know try something new or something old that you haven't really played with in a while uh, so yeah i actually think for my next gig which will be may 6th at the five spot in east nashville some great guests by the way uh, i think i might actually bring this rig um so i'll let you know how that goes uh, how that goes yeah I'll let you know how that goes um what else did I want to tell you about? Oh, uh, speaking of jonesing for things, I see I'm jumping all over the place. I mentioned earlier I was jonesing for a 4,005 base. I found myself jonesing for one of these latest editions of the Gretsch Malcolm Young ACDC signature guitar. Because um, I happened to play one. There's one at Nashville New and Used Music, and I played it. I probably shouldn't have because now I'm in love with the damn thing. And it's $3,400, so it's not like I'm going to go get one, but I thought I'd tell you about this thing because it's, you know, it goes on in my mind. I'm always thinking about guitars. Um, Malcolm Young famously used an old Gretsch that his brother gave him that he'd had extra pickups in, stripped the finish off. I've done all kinds of things to, and Gretsch made a very faithful, uh, you know, uh, replica of it that they sell, and it looks like this. Um, and uh, just for comparison's sake, they also uh, offer a model of that guitar, what it looked like in its original state, which was this. Uh, this is more what I thought that I would want if I was ever going to spend the money. Uh, you know, it has the same feel and everything, obviously, as the Malcolm, but it's more versatile. But this latest thing is they've released a version of his guitar in the middle state between those two extremes. What the guitar actually looked like in the early 70s when ACDC was touring, when Malcolm had added a Gibson humbucker in between the original pickups. And uh, uh, I, this is the, the version that I played. 
at National New News Music and just absolutely fell in love with. And it looks like this. So I just thought I'd share that. That's my latest obsession. Um, not going to get one, obviously, but uh, so I can sell a couple of nice higher-end pieces that I have. Uh, yeah, I just might. Who knows? But uh, let's just say it's not in the cards. But while we're on the subject of Gretsch, I had a brainstorm the other day for something new that I think Gretsch should introduce. And I actually went to the trouble of emailing their, their customer service line. I doubt anything will ever come of it, but you never know. And if it does, you can remember that you heard it here first. Um, in the 60s, Gretsch did something really radical. They released a model called the Bikini. It was actually a series. It was basically a 2x4 with a neck attached. And it came with a body made of thin wood with a hinge in the center so it would fold. Okay, now if you can picture this. You unfolded the body, it had a pair of plastic tracks on it, you slid the 2x4 center section in, and you had a guitar. Now the two cool things about this was, you could have one body and several different necks. You could have a guitar, a bass, ostensibly a 12-string if they ever made one uh, that they didn't, but I think they had plans to at one point in time. And the whole thing would fold up into a case not much bigger than like a pool cue case. Um, just to give you an idea, here's one of the guitars, and here's one of the basses, and here's a picture of one of the guitars and one of the basses in the folded down, stowed in their case, uh, you know, state right here. And they even made, the coolest thing, a, a double wide double neck version that you could slide these necks into so you could have the bass on the top, guitar on the bottom, two guitars, two bass, whatever you wanted, and it looked like this. Uh, it was a concept that was way ahead of its time. It flopped terribly, and uh, it kind of disappeared. The, no one important ever used one. They're just collector pieces now. But uh, I suggested that it would be so cool if Gretsch brought those back in a modern updated version, the same concept, but put them in the Electromatic or Streamliner range where they'd be affordable. And, uh, you know, for, let's say, $1,000, you could have multiple necks and a body. And, you know, or for a couple hundred dollars, you could just have, you know, regular body and one neck. I just think it'd be a cool thing to bring back. Um, they won't do it, but I'm curious to hear what kind of response I'll get from their customer service. I wouldn't be surprised if they didn't even know what I was talking about because none of the old timers probably work there anymore. They're owned by Fender now and whatever. I don't know. Maybe they'll do some research and see what I was talking about. Who knows? But if it does happen by some ridiculous chance, remember you heard it here first and I was the impetus. Okay, so enough about me. Now about my stuff. You guys seem to love looking at my gear. Um, every time I, I share part of the collection, I seem to get a lot of views. Uh, speaking of views, here you knew this was coming. Please like, subscribe, click the bell, share. Um, I'd like to see us growing a whole lot faster. Um, you know, I want to. I'd like to have a good reason to keep doing this. And uh, you know, it's kind of like playing to an empty room. Um, it's a whole lot more exciting when you've got a crowd, right? So anyway. I was going to show you the bottom row of guitars from the east wall. This is mostly acoustics and hollow bodies. Um, and i got a couple of favorites in here. So rather than talk anymore, let me show you a few things. This one I think you might have seen a while back. This is my Supreme Jumbo. Technically model S6N. Pick this bad boy up in a pawn shop for less than a hundred dollars. It's USA made. This is the company that became Harp Tone. And George Harrison famously used a Harp Tone version of this in a 12 string configuration live on stage at the uh, concert for Bangladesh. So, killer acoustic. Um, Picked it up thinking I'd flip it. Liked it way too much to get rid of. Uh, I may eventually get rid of it, but for now, it's sticking around.
this next one has a funny story to it. This is Betsy. Used to have a pig garden. It's a Sigma. The import line of Martin guitars that was available in the 70s and early 80s. This was their D41 replica, close to their top of the line. Um, and uh, I swear I thought that it said so inside here somewhere, but regardless, uh, you know, got the fake abalone binding and just an amazing, amazingly nice guitar, believe it or not. Even this import version was an amazingly nice guitar. But this particular one uh, smashed up and someone put Bondo on it. Headstock snapped off at some point and repaired with a couple of nails and some Bondo. Should be a complete steaming pile, right? I got this as part of a huge trade for a pedal steel guitar that I used to have. Some guy showed up at my house, wanted my pedal steel, which no one else had wanted. I'd been advertising it for months on the uh, Craigslist. He showed up at my house with a van and proceeded to unload something to the tune of 10 different items, like seven guitars, uh, an old computer, an amp, um, my, my first uh, Ibanez TSH-15 head came from that trade. He just unloaded all this stuff and said, will you take this? Meaning all this stuff for that. <laughs> sure. So I did. And uh, this was one of the items. And I looked at it and thought, well, this is garbage. And didn't touch it. And then one day, curiosity just got to me. I picked it up. It played amazing. It sounded amazing. Stayed perfectly in tune in spite of the terrible, catastrophic headstock injury and repair. And I wound up writing what's considered one of my best country songs, Train, with my friend Randy Fincham, on this guitar. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot of uh, emotional value to this thing, even if it has literally no monetary value whatsoever. So that's Betsy. Sorry I keep jumping out of shop, but hey, what are you going to do? Next up, one of my favorites, my beloved Bacon Belmont. Look at that Art Deco headstock. This, those of you with sharp eyes and know things about vintage guitars will recognize this bridge. We will recognize this guitar as a Gretsch. Gretsch made these. Um, they had their own version. Uh, one was called the Roundup, had a big G brand on it. But they made these for the Bacon Company, which was a banjo company that wanted to have a guitar line as well. Didn't have a pickup when I bought it. I had this pickup installed because I wanted to use it for open mic nights and songwriter rounds. All things being equal, I wish I'd never bothered to install a pickup and just left it because, well, for one thing, it's ugly and I just would rather have left it. But regardless, absolutely adore this guitar. Uh, it's almost in tune and I haven't had it out of the case in a year. Um, I know, if you, if you love it, why aren't you playing it? But I mean, there's so, only so much time and so many guitars, right? Anyway, this was hanging in the local Sam Ash guitar shop. And it was there a long time. And nobody seemed to want it. No one was interested. Um, it wasn't particularly cheap, but for what it was, it was pretty affordable. And every time I went in there, I would pick it up and play it say, man, I wish I could afford that thing. Well, one Christmas, my wife and daughter surprised me, and I owned it. Uh, it has flat-wound jazz guitar strings on it, and it did always, uh, you know, when I'd go visit it. So the first thing I did when I got it home, when I opened it up at Christmas time, was I stripped off the strings that were very old flat-wounds, put on a nice fresh set of Martin 8020 bronze 
acoustic strings, strummed it, and it sounded like absolute garbage. It was terrible. I was heartbroken. Hoping against hope that if I put some flat wands back on it, the tone would be back. Bought some Diodario Chromes, 13 gauge, threw them on here. There was the tone again, it was fine. This is an absolutely wonderful guitar. Uh, early 50s, probably literally 1950, 51, 52. Uh, there's no real exact dating these, but uh, yeah, love the bacon. Uh, this is the only bacon I interact with, being a vegetarian. So there's that. Next up is this lovely Firebird Red Gretsch, model 5129, with the factory Bigsby, and the Vibramate spoiler, which makes it possible to restring without pulling your hair out. Original DRM and pickups. This is one of the earliest of the Electromatic series guitars made in Korea. Wonderful guitar, black back, fire red top. I had purchased a chicken backer 325 John Lennon model. It's supposed to be like 325 V58, V59, whatever they are. Uh, the real early version of John Lennon's short scale. And it was okay. It wasn't great. I mean, it's certainly better than the 360F that I had. Nothing like my number one, but it was it was a playable guitar. It was all right. But I wasn't using it, so I thought, you know what, I'm going to, but this was a couple of years ago, right after I moved into this house, I put it up on Facebook Marketplace for possible trades, and again, I got the usual tons of crappy offers, and then some local guy, also named Steve, contacted me and sent me a picture of this, and at the time, it also had some, uh, other, like he attached this chrome armrest, and a couple of other interesting sort of rockabilly race car attachments and things that I didn't really care for but I recognize it immediately as what it was it's one of the great early electromatics which you know these are great guitars they really are he came over played my little fake Rick said I've always wanted one of these handed me this along with a strap that literally this guitar was all the way to my knees this guy was every bit of six foot seven and that strap made sense for him Anyway, traded me, came with the original hard shell case, still has his name, Dymo, labeled on it, <laughs> but uh, great guitar, and uh, I do use it. In fact, I used it for the very first Raygun gig uh, four years ago, and uh, yeah, great guitar. While we're back on Gretsch's. This is my Tim Armstrong model. Tim Armstrong of the band Rancid. This is based on a, uh, a Gretsch Country Club. Apparently he has an original that he plays. He's left-handed, plays it flipped over. Beats the ever-living snot out of it. And uh, he had to make this this is the top of the line of the Electromatic series. They're like $1,500, um, whereas most Electromatics are, you know, well under a grand. Um, this was any higher up, it'd be a real Gretsch, right? Uh, as opposed to an Electromatic. Great guitar. Uh, flat black, very rockabilly and or punk or whatever, kind of stripped down. Love this. Um, this was actually uh, my uh, 10th anniversary gift from my wife. I bought her a really cool diamond ring that she had a hankering for, and she bought me this. So, yeah, pretty cool, eh? And the final guitar from that wall this is an RC Allen. Jazz Le Grand, uh, Le Jazz Grand, four string. Now 
not a tenor, plectrum guitar. 25 and uh, 3 quarter inch scale like a Gibson, tuned DG, BD. Uh, great for all your fa favorite Rolling Stone drifts. Um, very cool guitar. Doesn't get as much play as it should, but uh, I intend to rectify that this year. Now, this guy used to be known, R.C. Allen. He's passed away a few years ago. Uh, he was known for a long time as like, it's in here. It's a guitar pick in here. Uh, the Hillbilly D'Angelico. Because until a couple years ago when D'Angelico came back, the only D'Angelicos were the originals from the 50s and 60s, which were, you know, $50,000 jazz boxes. Uh, they just brought the name back, and, uh, you know, it's something different now, but John D'Angelico was a master builder. Anyway, this guy, R.C. Allen, was considered the hillbilly D'Angelico. He built all these things in his garage. i got to get that out of there. And, uh, yeah, four strings. Guitar scale, DGBD, a lot of fun. And uh, for a guy like me that knows how to work one of these, it's pretty great, you know. Yeah, very cool. So, that is the lower east wall. <laughs> So if you hung on this long, we're at 41 minutes and change. Uh, I appreciate it. Thanks for sticking around. Uh, until I see you next, do all the things that I asked. Uh, if possible, stop by uh, and drop something in the Venmo virtual tip jar. If you can't, that's okay too. Just keep watching because we, we, me, myself, and I uh, love having you. And uh, tell a friend. And... Um, if you have some suggestions, by all means, drop them below. You know, I actually do read and usually respond to each and every suggestion. Now, you get a couple of people that make some, you know, prickish remarks that I might ignore, but uh, discretion is the better part of valor, so I'm told. So until you hear from me next, which I believe will be the Schecter 8 string unboxing, maybe, you know, like tomorrow or something, um, be good to yourself and others. Stay cool, stay frosty. Chime on, rock out, keep on keeping on, and most importantly, play the damn guitar. Aight? All right. Steve out.